Sunday of the month. Uh, with the third Sunday of the month, we pray uh, the service of Matins. Uh, so go ahead and uh, put your marker there on page 219. Uh, Matins begins on 219. Uh, we open up with our first tier on 578. In 578.
Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will he return to the evil to my enemies. In, in your faithfulness, put an end to them. O oh God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. O oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. For they have delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evils to my enemies. In your faithfulness, let an end to them. Maybe see them. First reading for this morning is from 2 Samuel chapter 22. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself lean toward the truth. You save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a truth, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in Him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the height. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Second lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to to endure it. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. And our last reading for this morning is from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. Jesus also said that to, to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do. 
so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their house. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the, to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of life. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Thank you be to God. The service continues as we sing the common response read on page 221. Please sing. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Some things. 
things we really can't handle at all, and yet they happen. And so this is not what St. Paul is saying. He doesn't here tell us we will be able to handle all of life's troubles perfectly. No, he doesn't say that. Here again, what he does say, he says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. St. Paul is pointing to temptation. He's not talking about the crummy things that can happen in our life that, that, uh, that is out of our control. No, he's pointing to the temptation to sin. And notice what he says concerning temptation. He says we're all in the same boat. There is no new temptation under the sun. People have been there and done that before. And it is in the face of temptation to sin that God gives you the way out. He gives us the help that we need. And so to prove his point, that we're all in the same boat, that there's no new temptation under the sun, Paul gives five examples from the Old Testament of God's people, Israel, being tempted, and some falling into the temptation, yet the majority always being spared by God's grace and love. And just as St. Paul says, these five examples are to be used for our instruction to show us the way that we should not go. So the first of these examples is from verse 6. If you look on uh, the first verse of our epistle lesson, it says this. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they, that is, the Old Testament people of Israel, that we might not desire evil as they, did. This is a vague illusion to the fact that the Israelites, after they had been graciously removed out of Egypt, walked on the dry land through the Red Sea as uh, they got on the other side and saw Pharaoh and his armies drowned in that Red Sea. Right after that happened, they found out that they didn't like the food that God provided. And so they said, we wish we were back in Egypt because at least we got some onions and some better meat there. Never mind that we were slaves. They desired that evil over what God had provided for them. The result being that God sent a plague and killed a whole bunch of them. The next example is in verse 7. Verse 7 says, Do not be idolaters, as some of, some of them, and that's God's Old Testament people of Israel, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. This is the golden calf event, which Paul alludes to. Again, right after Moses got those people out of slavery, he went up to a mountain to speak with God, to receive instructions from the Lord. And as he was gone, the people, led by Aaron, took all of the gold which they had plundered from the Egyptians. They melted it down and fashioned it into a golden calf, an idol, and there built an altar before it and made sacrifices to it, rather than acknowledging that their God had released them from slavery. 
Moses came down and was not happy to say the least. He had to stop God, in fact, from totally obliterating these people. But their punishment, Moses sent the Levites through the crowd with their swords outstretched. About 3,000 died. The third example of temptation that Paul gives us from the Old Testament begins in verse 8. He says, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. This is an event that is recorded in the book of Numbers, chapter 25. This is where, before God's people, Israel, entered into the Promised Land, they found themselves in the land of Moab, among the Moabite people. These were not followers of the Lord God. And uh, they were celebrating a, 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 a fertility rite. Uh, asking their God's blessings on their agriculture. Part of that rite included sleeping with temple prostitutes. And they invited God's people, Israel, to join in. Of course, they did. Again, the result of that falling into temptation, as Paul records, 23,000 of the Israelites died. Fourth temptation of Israel comes in verse 9 of the epistle, saying, we must not put Christ to the test, as some of them, again, the Old Testament people Israel did, and were destroyed by serpents. This brings to mind an event in the book of Numbers where the people were impatient with God, were grumbling and complaining, and so God sent snakes into the people, and bit them, and many died until Moses erected up high on a pole of bronze serpent that anyone who looked at the serpent would live. Again, God provided a way out. And the last temptation example is similar to that. That's verse 10. Again, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, Paul just gives a list of five. Five temptations that are not new under the sun. Have you experienced any of these? Have you desired to do something that isn't right or is downright evil? Have you found yourself putting something first in your life other than God? A spouse or a child? a want of a possession or money, even practicing another religion? Have you desired a sexual experience that is not in accord with how God has designed sexuality to be within his people? Have you ever been impatient or grumbled about another person? See, again, here St. Paul, no temptation has ever overtaken you that is not common to man. And the truth is we have experienced all of these and more. And sometimes, like the Israelites, we fall. We do the sin that Satan tempts us to do. Thanks be to God, however, that we don't have plagues, or Levites, or serpents, or other horrible things that killed many Israelites for their sin. Sure, the majority remained alive and intact, but what a scary scene to witness as people were dying around them because of sin. Rather, for us, St. Paul writes, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So the truth of this scripture is that whenever we face temptation, we always have the ability to 
to resist it. That's the truth that Paul speaks as he writes this scripture. Granted, in our weakness, we sometimes do not resist, but the point remains. Every temptation to sin can be resisted. But when we do not resist, we indeed still have the way out. And the way out is a loving God who himself experienced the very greatest temptation imaginable, and yet he resisted and remained faithful. In Paul's example of the Israelites, you see, in the wilderness, many of the Israelites failed in their temptation. But when Jesus was in the wilderness, being tempted by the devil himself, he remained utterly faithful, thus giving us the way out. It is because he lived that perfectly sinless life, because he died the death that we deserve, and because he rose from the dead, through these things that he did for us, we indeed have the way out and our way into God's kingdom of love and grace. Now, that doesn't mean that we can indeed fall to every temptation that comes our way because we know there's a way out. No, on the contrary, Jesus, when he taught the church to pray, included a petition to keep us from temptation, knowing that they would come and that God's people should resist in order to live a God-pleasing life. So we will end with that petition and with Luther's teaching of it. Of course, we pray, lead us not into temptation. What does this mean? Luther asks. He reminds us that God tempts no one. Of course, it is Satan, the deceiver, who tempts. Luther reminds us, God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory, which is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding guard our hearts and minds in the one true faith, even in the life everlasting. Amen. We respond to the preaching of God's word as we sing our praises. Uh, we'll sing our praises in the words of the Te Deum. Te Deum is on page 223. Please stand as we sing.
our God with our tithes and our offerings. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 
merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, that they may obtain their petitions. Make them to ask such things as shall please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, not and run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.